All right. Monday morning analyst right here on the MMA Hour. Thank you guys so much for joining me. I greatly appreciate it. Sweetener anti-vaxxers and all. Um, all right. So there were some fights that I had missed the whole time while I was out. Um, some of which I watched, some of which I didn't. I saw the Greg Hardy fight at UFC, whatever it was, uh, Fort Lauderdale. I saw uh, Jack Hermanson with a tough win over Jacare. That was cool. Um, so the Rory McDonald fight, but those are two weeks in the past. The one that happened over the weekend, well, the Canelo Alvarez fight, but by the way, zone, Jesus Christ, they screwed that up. Neither here nor there. The one that I wanted to talk to you guys about was, of course, UFC Ottawa. Al Iaquinta facing Donald Cerrone. To me... This was one of those fights where I took a couple of lessons from it. I think the first is that Donald Cerrone, in my judgment, is pretty much the clear runaway choice as the best UFC fighter to never win a title. And I know some folks push back on that a little bit. I'm sure there are some ways in which you could debate it. Folks have said, what about Yoel? Yoel's right up there in the conversation. There can be no doubt about it. But to me, he doesn't have the overall body of work with the win that uh, Donald Cerrone scored against Ally Quinta, he became literally the winningest UFC fighter of all time in terms of aggregate number of wins, not percentage, of course, but um, he has 23 wins. No one's ever done that in the UFC. He's the first. I think that counts for a lot. Number, number That's number one. Number two, uh, some folks, including me, thought that Yoel beat Bobby Knuckles the second time they fought, but he didn't, so it didn't really matter in the end, so you can't really count that. I know he beat some other champions, but this is also my point. Cerrone's been in there fighting the 155ers and the 170ers of the world. These are objectively tougher weight classes. So to be the winningest fighter with that kind of longevity in those two weight classes, 155 and 170 are the premier destination for the best athletes and the best action in MMA, generally speaking. To me, it makes him the best one to never win a title. And I don't say that pejorative of like, oh, he never won a title. You have to count it because it's sort of glaring that he has all those wins and not a belt. At the same time, though, to do that, to beat the guys he's beating, especially at this stage in his career where he's beating Mike Perry, he's submitting him, he's beating Al Iaquinta, and the, the, I forget who the other one was before this. I'm, I'm losing my mind a little bit with a lack of sleep, but you get the idea. He's not beating chumps, man. He's beating Al Iaquinta is a top-level UFC lightweight. There can be no doubt about this. Um, and Cerrone maybe lost a round or two, maybe two. So to me, he's your consensus Easy pick for best fighter to never win um, a, a UFC title. Again, I know some folks are going to disagree with that, but they're wrong. The other thing to consider here is beyond that, though, when you look at Cerrone's game, like what is making the difference? I know that that weight cut to 155 really hurts him, but it doesn't seem to show up in those fourth and fifth rounds as a real detrimental uh, factor to success. Now, maybe there are some other ways you could me measure the detriment that that weight cut does to him, but it's not in performance in the fourth and fifth round. Those were his, the third, fourth, and fifth round were the best ones in this contest, number one. There was no clear physical drop-off. In fact, his fifth round was the highest intensity level he had of all five rounds. And on top of that, he scored, I think, 138, maybe 140 significant strikes. That's the most he's ever scored in a fight in his UFC tenure. So we're talking about a guy who doesn't show the effects of weight cutting, at least not to um, these kinds of observations. And so I think he's actually better suited at 155 than 170. And the reason I'm going to make that argument is, one, I think, yeah, he has some nice wins at 170, but I would argue his best wins are probably at 155. Certainly the Al Quinta win is right up there with one of the better ones. Because Al was actually really in this fight, and he had a pretty good game plan. But the point I'm trying to make is, uh, I haven't measured this for sure, but it looks to me when he fights at 155 versus 170, he enjoys, not always, but generally, more of a height differential. That really suits his game. His game is much more dynamic when he can lord that over opposition. That was one of the reasons why Ally Quinta had some difficulties in this fight. All right, let's go to the slide here if we can. Okay, so how did a cowboy, did I spell everything right today? Barely. Yes, all right. Uh, how cowboy bested Ally Quinta. Standard disclaimer that I always give. Not presenting this to you as the only analysis or the best analysis, certainly not the most complete. As we say in political polling, these are my top line findings. There are many more you could get to, but this is a, a, a general way in which to understand what happened and why. So I always encourage you to go seek out other analysts and decide for yourself actually what really is true and not. Although I'm going to make, as I always do, folks always ask me, like, what gives you the right to, to say what happened in a fight? I'm making claims. 
and then I'm showing you visual evidence of them. What gives me the right is the evidence. Show me that the evidence is wrong, and then the claims fall apart. But I don't rely on credentialism. I rely on evidence. First things first, distance management. Now, distance management, sometimes folks think means always be far apart or, or always, you know, always pushing away. And to be clear, that is a component here. Donald Cerrone was able to defeat Al Quinta in no small part because Al was really outside and had some success, of course, but in general, some real difficulties closing that distance. And so managing that space, either by keeping it far apart or striking when Al came in to close the pocket, that was really a key component of it. So uh, uh, for sure, that's one thing that it means. For me, though, managing the distance also means understanding which shot selections are important at those ranges because eventually that pocket is going to collapse and eventually there are going to be in boxing range and then in sort of like clinch almost range and dirty boxing range let's say and then you have to understand what your objectives are in that space which is tag and then move or tag and then push back right so it's not really that you're retreating and then establishing or you're sticking and moving like a you want to get really good at sticking and then establishing more distance she's always creating space Sometimes he would push back into Al Iaquinta and then make him create space. So I always want to make sure when folks understand, when I say distance management, it's not stick and then move. It can be that. Sometimes it was that. It's also a lot more. Number two, and this was really the key to the whole thing beyond just the distance, uh, employ diversity of strikes, jab, and kicks in all conditions. Let me start with the second one, then we'll move to the, to the first one here. Kicks in all conditions. What do I mean? Wow, <laughs> you could do a whole study on how Donald Cerrone employs kicks in an MMA fight. You could do a whole study on how he employs kicks in just this fight. Let me go through some of them. Number one, starting combinations with them, ending combinations with them, throwing them nakedly, um, throwing in the inside to disrupt rhythm, throwing to the outside to cause pain, um, faking them, making them look one way and then coming over the top, not quite like Israel Adesanya, but certainly making it look a little bit difficult, um, using them to enter range, using them to exit range, all kinds of different mechanisms in which he is doing this. A jab serves a lot of purpose, right? One, to sting, two, to measure distance, three, to disrupt timing, right? His leg kicks and his kicks generally do that. Um, when he would, when Ally Quinta would close the distance, you'll see this, he would quickly switch his feet and then throw a shot to the body, right? So he's punishing you for closing distance. As other times where he's, uh, it looks like he is gonna go one way and he fakes and then goes another one and takes you off your balance. Like the, um, the, the, the myriad ways in which he employs them in so many different contexts, I, again, I can't be clear about this, it deserves its own breakdown. Just understand when you're looking through these pieces of evidence that I'm about to show you, this is central to everything. You have to deal with not only his jab, which we'll talk about in just a second, but all these other factors. When you're coming in, when you're escaping, when you're setting an angle, when you're switching stance, when you're whatever, he's got all kinds of answers and he uses them in ways very, very quickly that a lot of other guys don't. Then you go to the jab. What's so important about this? Again, between that and all the stuff that's happening with his legs, he's like a soccer player who can use his hands almost. It's kind of hard to describe. He was pumping that jab over and over and over and over and over again, and it was bloodying the face. It was disrupting the timing. It was confusing Al because there were ways in which he was using the jab to set up kicks, and there were ways in which he, was, he wasn't. It was just a masterclass and a phenomenal use of his jab, and it really made a huge, huge impact, right? There's more to the story, of course, but in the interest of time, you get the idea. Uh, move, 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 and move again. Here's one big difference between Cerrone now and Cerrone before. Cerrone now, the times he got caught was when he either misjudged distance or when he planted his feet and then tried to exchange. But more commonly, what was happening was, and Al had a, uh, some good traps too. I don't want to take anything away from Al. Al actually fought a pretty good fight. But the, the key here is he would jab and move. Not necessarily creating distance. Sometimes he would just change angle on you. But he goes and marries movement with strikes so much more and so much better than he used to. When I say more, I don't mean big sweeping motions. We've talked about this before. Sometimes an angle change can just be this. 
you know, sometimes it can be major angle change, but a lot of times that's hard, it's hard to go from facing to 90 degrees on an opponent, right? You have to be, that's to be a, that person has to be kind of a scrub, to be honest with you, to get that, right? Or you, ha or you have to have some kind of a crazy, you know, ability to angle switch on someone, like a, like a Lomachenko. But generally speaking, the angle switches can often be a little bit subtle. Some of the movement is to facilitate that. Some of it is to escape. Some of it is to close. But he is marrying strikes and movement, which makes him much less of a target. Now, he still gets hit a lot. If you look at his um, strikes absorbed per minute and strikes landed per minute, they're still in the four range each. So it, it, he could be better about it, of course. Like, nobody's a perfect fighter. But one of the things that kept him alive in this contest and kept him really um, putting, jab, uh, putting the jab and then the kicks and everything together was he didn't just throw them and kind of stand there. He threw them and was on his horse, man, the whole time. And then last but not least, negate the level change in body work. You saw Ally Quinta leaning heavy on the front leg. That's why you saw, for example, uh, Donald Cerrone really go to the inside of the leg because if this guy was heavy on it, it would disrupt his rhythm or to the outside to cause pain. So he couldn't do it. Why, do, why was he level changing and, uh, and or at least lowering his level and going to the body? Because that's a known vulnerability. I've been talking about Ally Quinta. It's a known vulnerability of Donald Cerrone. He did a good job in, in, in negating that one by threatening body kicks when he came in, punch, punching him with the jab. There was a time when he, uh, uh, on a shot, he drilled a knee right into Ally Quinta because he had a short distance to travel, and that's something he's really good at, exploiting the height differential, right? So Al wanted to lower his level and really go to work to the body, and he had some success going body head, but... I think Cowboy minimized the worst of it, is what I would say, because Al did land, but he minimized the worst of it through movement, all these other tricks, um, and just sort of anticipating like not only the attacks that Al was doing, but finding the right strike at the right time when he was heavy on that front leg, really going to work on it so that he had a problem maintaining the kinds of attacks he was using early on. All right, real quickly, let's look at the math on this one. Um, not a whole lot to it. I didn't have a time to go look at all the stuff. Just one thing I would point to here is um, this, this is what I mean when I'm talking about Cerrone having high output. You know, he's landing 20 strikes, 21, 28 in the third, and then you look at the fourth and the fifth, 26. So on par, let me blow this up. Look at the fifth round, fifth, 43 of 98. Like he was on it, bro, on it. This is what I mean. This, the idea that a weight cut really hurts him, it might. It just doesn't show up in the numbers. And then real quickly, let's look at the targeting here. Here's one thing I've noticed for Donald Cerrone. Throw out a situation where you look at the Mike Perry numbers, and you, you, this won't be true, but I, pay, I want you to pay attention to this right here. When Donald Cerrone has a high head count, he can, he can exchange these fairly evenly, where he can have a lot of leg attacks and, and some to the body, a lot to the body on some leg attacks. That can change a lot, but when he really gets going is when he's popping his opponents to the head. If you can limit that, the rest of this kind of falls apart because these are secondary attacks usually to what's happening up here. His best work is when he's attacking your head, either with a punch or a kick. And that's true of a lot of opponents, but it's especially, or of fighters, it's especially true with him. If you can limit the head count, go look at fights where he lost and look at how much he targeted the head. It's Typically, not always, a little bit reduced, all right? And, of course, easier said than done. You know, let's keep that in mind. I'm just making shit up. Uh, okay. So let's look at what the evidence has to say. And, again, what gives me the right to make the argument? The evidence. I'm, I am presenting to you an argument. Here is the visual evidence for it. All right. So we, saw, we know what Al is trying to do. He's trying to go lower his level. He's trying to get real low. He wants to find a way to close the distance. He might double up on his jab as a consequence. He might go to the body and then go to the head. He's just trying to find creative ways to collapse that space. So let's see what he does here. So he kind of does the old, you know, Three Stooges thing here, throws it out, and look right away at the recognition from Cerrone. Right away, boom, and he goes to the body. So he is already to, a couple things are happening here. One, it's a hard shot. Two, he's hitting him at the range that's going to prevent Al from now using his hands because he has to bring his arms up. He's going to land because I think he gets a bit of a parry there, a little bit of a parry, but it lands hard right to the, to the top of the rib cage. So not quite in the soft area that would be really painful, but he's kicking him. The timing is perfect because he's getting him before he's too close. So it lands at the right spot, you know, right-ish spot. 
Uh, he's forcing him to bring his hands up so he can't really counter, so he's not necessarily so vulnerable by throwing the kick. Uh, it's an unorthodox way to crush somebody when they're closing. Most people want to punch by instinct when someone else is coming in. So he's just doing a lot with this. You can already see that establishes uh, certain conditions under which Al's going to have to get by. right? And then look at that. He's able to move away right away. Always pay attention to the movement after the fact. I know that Cowboy said after the fight, his first round, he wasn't in it. But if you watch the tape, he looked like he was in it to me. Uh, all right, here we are again. Here comes Al faking. And he stutter steps. And I want you to point out here, whenever Al would get too close, you're going to watch a lot of things that Cowboy does. He slips, clinches, and then pushes. This looks like nothing. It's a lot. This is what I'm talking about managing distance. What do I need to do at various intervals to protect myself and to hurt my opponent? And he decided at several intervals in this fight, this is merely one of them. I don't go to all of them, but go back and watch the tape. This happens so many times where you see Al try and close the distance, or either double, tripling up on his jab again, body, head, all the different tricks. And what you notice from Donald is sometimes he tries to counter, sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes he just covers up, collapses the space, he moves into, he moves into uh, Iaquinta and then pushes back, and now he has all the space that he needs again. You know, Save yourself for one exchange so you can fight the other one. It's a smart strategy. Here we are, still the first round. Let's watch what's happening here. Al is circling this way. All right, let's see what happens. Let's see. All right, so Donald tries to catch him, takes a wide stance, punches. Al kind of slips, and then you see Cerrone push forward, and Al exits at an angle. He lands the first one. And by the way, if you look closely, Donald does a bit of a stance switch there. See that? A little bit, a little bit. Not, he doesn't say they're very long. This is what Poirier does. People are like, oh, Poirier's a stance switcher. He can be, but he predominantly uses it to close distance. You see Don Cerrone doing the same thing. He's blitzing, pushing you back, switching stances a little bit, which is called shifting in this particular case, to get the best out of it. Oh, God. All right. Oh, I mean, what are we doing here? <laughs> All right, all right, um, God. All right. So there you go. Uh, okay, 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 okay. So here we go, next setup. Still in the first round, let's watch. And look how far apart they are, right? I mean, you could do it if you had a lunging punch, you could make it, but you'd expose yourself as a consequence. So here you go, watch Al. He's going to, old TJ Dillashaw bit, and then he steps wide. So this is, this is classic TJ. I'm not saying he took it from TJ, but TJ employs this a lot, where you shift feet, and then you go back, and then you take a wide stance, and now you're in a left-handed stance if you're Iaquinta, and then you want to go, and look, Donald sort of does the same thing again. He sort of lowers his level, gets hit a little bit, clinches and pushes. But you can see, I, I, I included that because I thought it was a nice trick from... Um, from Ally Quinta. All right, and then you see him follow up here, and Donald's on his horse the whole time. All right, here we go. Let's see what happens. Jab touches him, but not hard, right? And I love this from Donald. So what do you notice here? So they're pretty far apart. That's a long step jab. It's a nice one. It's just a little bit short, because it has to take a long step. But then, watch this. So what he does is, this is what he does all the time. You saw Ovin St. Peru knock out, I think, Corey Anderson this way. They measure with the jab, and then they bring a head kick behind it. So this is another scenario where he use, he's using kicks. One, to kill you when you come in to close distance um, by going to the body. Here's another way. Kind of pulls the way out of the jab, measures with his own jab. He's not, he's not trying to hurt you with this. It'd be nice if he did, but he's not trying to. But he is trying to measure so he can crack you that way. And Al read it just in time to get out of the way. Again, this incredibly dynamic use where it's, you think one thing is happening and it's coming up from another angle. All kinds of crazy stuff. Here we are still in the first round. Let's watch. Boom. Look at this shot. It's just great timing and a great read from a guy like this. He is used to using his height to make a problem for opponents when they shoot in and come low. So, boom. Boom. Just like that. Just like that. And then, of course, by the way, Cerrone's takedown defense, 
People think he has bad takedown defense or something, like he's still WEC Don Cerrone. 73%, man, that's very high. It's very high for a striker, especially, right? And then he gets out of the way. So great takedown defense there. You could go into the mechanics of that. Here you go, round two. We're not going to look at all the rounds, just so you know. All right, here it comes. Here you go. Um, look, Donald sort of taking a wide stance, putting his hands out there to, like, disrupt timing, maybe getting the uh, impair the vision. And so Al takes a nice step and measures and misses. And I love this from Donald. He is so good at this little pop right here. And it's almost an arm punch. It's nice and short. Can't be more than 18 inches. He just kind of pops you as you come in. And it's designed to either impact your vision or disrupt your timing or whatever. And then he usually puts something else behind it. Go back to the Rick Story combo, where all, not all those punches were hard. Some of them he's just making contact, and so he can make sure you know, he knows where you are. He can confuse you by going body head, and then he would throw the big head kick in. And that's what he, and, you know, that's what he closed the show with here. Watch this. Just keep your eyes on Donald. Right? He reads it. Pop. Just, just right on the half beat. Boom. So now, the torque of the punch and the angle is probably going to be off because it's hard to throw when you're getting punched in the face. So Donald ducks it. And off this lean, he does this all the time, this kind of, you know, like this Paul Wall sitting sideways punch and then pops you as he turns off uh, and he pivots off the front foot. Look at this. Close, leans, pop as he pivots back into rotation. He didn't do that a bunch in this fight, but if you watched his career, you've seen that. He is so good at ducking under and, and, and using trunk movement to roll, pop, and then rotate back with his lead foot, or his rear foot. It's just phenomenal work. So there we go. A little bit further into the fight. Okay, all right. Pop, pop, boom. And watch this closely. Touches him here, that's not a hard jab. Touches him again, and what does that look like? What does that look like? That looks like the first round where he put the fist out and he was gonna try and throw a head kick. So that might be what he's thinking. Instead, he goes to the bottom and disrupts his timing. And by the way, watch Cowboy. He starts here. Let's see where he ends up. Look how far away he is from that. And switch his stance for a second there, right? Because he ends up in Southpaw for a little bit, just for a second, right? Nice work here. Just marrying fundamentals with nice things. And I'm, by the way, I showed the shifting he was doing. He'll shift to close distance, but it would not be correct to call Cowboy Cerrone a stance switcher, which I've made before, which people thought found controversial, but I think the tape makes that pretty clear. All right, here we are. Al, here comes out. This was a nice shot from Al. Fakes, lowers his level, slips the punch. Boom. Kind of tries to hit the liver and then comes over the top. That was a nice shot from Al Iaquinta. I wanted to make sure I put that in there. Even in that fifth round, man, he was trying to get after it. It wasn't a good round for him, but you know, credit to Ally Quinta. He was always in this fight. And I know he was in a lot of pain and discomfort, but he was getting after it. So I really appreciate that from him. All right, boom. And he just follows it up again. This is nice work from Al. And then he goes after it again. This time, um, Donald gets revenge. We'll look at this real closely one more time. This is just nice work from Al. He fakes, takes another step inside, slips the punch this time. From Donald, Donald kind of sees him lowering, so you can see Donald kind of, you know, uh, protect himself. Pow, pow, over the top. That was a pick your poison scenario, and this is a case where look what happens. What did I mention before? When Donald's not moving is when he gets popped right over the top. Kind of st sets his feet, throws. You notice he didn't angle out. He didn't back up. Look at him. He didn't angle out. He didn't back up. And that's when he gets hit. When he's on the move like that, he's much better. All right, here we are again. Ducking. What happened here? What am I looking at? I kind of forgot. Let's see. Oh. Uh, oh, yeah, he switched, he switched stance a little bit here. A little bit. A little bit, right? All right. Let's see. Let's see what happens. Look how far apart they are, right? So this, is the, this was the main... This was the central problem that he faced, Ali Quinta, in, in trying to get this fight. And you see him faking the knee, which brings his hands down. Caught, he gets, catches him a little bit with a jab, not much. And then Donald responds in kind, moving his feet, moving his feet. 
ducks, he anticipates the right hand, and then pushes off again. Again, lowering, rolling, clinching, pushing. Yeah? And it, and it just resets everything, so now you're far apart. It's just good work. All right, here he is again, blitzing forward, shifting, not too far, kind of retreats a little bit, then gets out of the way. Good work again. Here we are. Boom. Hard. And he gets, when he misjudges the uh, distance here, that's when he gets cracked. That's a nice shot from Maya Quinta. We go to the third round. Just a few more of these, I promise. All right, we're pushing in, pushing in. You see Iaquinta change stances. Donald reads it right away and throws a kick to the body and then decides to move away. Forces him to reconsider. That's just great recognition from him. If you ask, again, if you ask me, the movement's a big part of the change of Don Cerrone, but the recognition of what he's up against, like, I don't know if he's scouting opposition or just making great reads in space, but that is what, to me, looks like the major difference for him competitively. And I know he's training with Joe Schilling. I don't know exactly what Joe is helping him refine or work on, but just what the, what the tape shows, the tape shows a fighter much more in motion, much more um, deliberate and careful, but effective in shot selection and reading what the opposition gives him. Just making really phenomenal reads. And again, I don't know if that comes from pre-fight scouting or not. Here we are again, Al is circling, circling, changing stances. This is interesting. He's gonna go right, then left, and then through the middle, and Donald reads it the whole time. Look, watch, keep your eyes on Donald's Keep your eyes on this. Pop, and then gets under it, and ready to go to work. It's just, it's just, it's just great reads. It's, it's a simple touch, but it disrupts everything. Here he is again, faking high, coming in low, grabbing. Donald does a great job of defending. He's a great, great single leg defender. Not a real takedown threat. Donald probably knows it because he just wants to get close enough, Ali Quinta does, to punch him. But Donald gets out of the way, moving his feet. Man, I'm telling you, it's just, it's just really solid fundamentals from Donald Cerrone. Really solid stuff. Pop, and he moves. He gets hit a little bit. He gets, he gets touched there. It's nice. Al's kind of moving into him. Pow. That's what I'm talking about. It's the angle of this punch, the lean. Now, that, we saw before where he rolled and then popped. Watch this. He's going to jab. And then he does the, the Dutch hand trap or whatever it's called. Doesn't quite get it, but he gets Al to pull back, right? Because look at Al's hands before. Now they go behind him, so he must have thought there was some kind of kick coming. And instead he punches, and then he gets that lean. So it creates, look, he's off balance here to a degree, but he gets that lean and he can pop just at the right angle. Look at that, pow. And then for a second he's left-handed, but then he goes back, all right? It's just good work. Again anticipating, puts his head off the center line, top of the thigh, crushing that leg. Here we are again, Al is circling, All right? Punch, look at the timing on this thing. Pop, it's just this short thing. What makes it work is the timing is impeccable. Pop, look at this. Half beat, talk about it all the time. All the time, man. If you can master that, you're going to give people hell. You're going to give people hell. One more thing that I want to show because it was so good. So here he is. Don Cerrone was throwing, by the way, I didn't show them before because I don't have enough time. He was jabbing constantly. He was going to the body constantly with both roundhouse and then front kicks. So then he does this, kind of hits him right in the side of the face. All right. And Iquinta doesn't really change his defense. Probably not expecting it to be back to back. So Donald kind of resets, move, fades left. You'll see him fade this direction, just a slight degree, puts his hands out, hands come out from Iaquinta, and then pops him one time and drops him. So I'm talking about with the kicks, man. You saw him off balance to the inside, pain to the outside, uh, roundhouse to the body when the guy was closing distance, front kicks the whole time, teeps to the gut, teeps to the face, set up twice, just all uh, his, his uh, head kicks off the fake jab. I mean, it's like it's an endless array of things he uses. And then he's got that short little pop right in front of you. And the reason why he's able to do that in part is not just because he has great timing, but if you are far away, he, he all, he's, not, he's not throwing a huge shot. He just has to connect right in front. You're slow enough and far apart enough in your ascent and your distance closing where he can just find it over and over again. It's incredible, man. It's really incredible. That's a nice left hook to the body, but 
again, it's that sort of short punch. This time it was a hook from Cerrone, uh, but I Quinta got his own. Last thing, we'll just show a couple of these. I like this one, right? So it's a hook, gets to a left-handed stance, throws an uppercut, and then moves kind of back into a right-handed stance there. A little bit of stance switchery in this one. Uses it to distance close and like, change a little bit, but predominantly in this particular case, stays in orthodox. And then he goes to the inside, pushes back on the blitz. Didn't do a lot of cage cutting. Kind of followed a little bit. Not sure if that was intentional or not. And then you get the idea they had this exchange. Okay, that's it. That's all we have to show. Um, you, can put the, you can put up the thumbnail. So there you go. There were your lessons today where you had a Donald Cerrone who was showing a ton of dynamic work with his kicks, but marrying that with punches up top, really getting nice reads in front of him because of the distance he's able to create. But to me, what really matters is you got a guy who took his strengths and he didn't lose them. He built on them while slowly chipping away at his weaknesses. He added in a lot more movement. He added in a lot more um, angle switching, a little bit of stance switching either to close or to create confusion. Doesn't stay there very long. You know, Max Holloway can stay in this position or just stay in this position. Donald doesn't do that, but he does create just enough confusion. You don't know if it's coming left or right, up or down, punch or kick. You just, it's so many weapons you have to deal with, and now he's getting out of the way more and getting hit a little bit less. It was pretty incredible, and that's my Monday Morning Analyst.